الحمد لله الحمد لله الواحد الأبد والصلاة والسلام على النبي الأمي العربي المنزل عليه إن الله وملائكته يصلون على النبي يا أيها الذين آمنوا صلوا عليه وسلموا تسليما اللهم صل وسلم وزد وتفضل وتبارك ونعم على أفضل الموجودات وأحسن الموجودات وأكمل الموجودات وأجمل الموجودات سيد السادات سيدنا محمد رسول الله صلى الله تعالى عليه وسلم أما بعد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته The ever bountiful creator Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has blessed this universe with the sending down of the glorious Quran. And he, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, uses this name in his final revelation. For example, in Surah Al-Baqarah, Surah number 2, Ayah number 185, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, A'udhu billahi min ash-shaytan rajim شهر رمضان الذي أنزل فيه القرآن. The month of Ramadan is that in which the Quran was sent down. Or in Surah An-Nisa, Ayah number 82, Allah Subhanahu wa Taala says, "أَفَلَا يَتَدَبَّرُونَ الْقُرْآنَ وَلَوْ كَانَ مِنْ عِنْدِ غَيْرِ اللَّهِ لَوَجَدُوا فِيهِ اخْتِلَافًا كَثِيرًا." Do they not ponder over the Quran? Had this Quran been from other than Allah, they would certainly have found in it many discrepancies, much inconsistency. Or in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in Surah Al-Nahl, Surah number 16, Ayah number 98, فَإِذَا قَرَأْتَ الْقُرْآنِ فَاسْتَعِذْ بِاللَّهِ مِنَ الشَّيْطَانِ الرَّجِيمِ And when you recite the Qur'an, seek refuge with Allah from shaitan the rajim. Now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions this name in the glorious Qur'an 70 times, 70 times, right? Now, what is the definition of Qur'an? The Qur'an is the word of Allah or the speech of Allah revealed to the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam through the angel Jibreel alayhi salam in the Arabic language. The word of Allah revealed to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam through Jibreel Alayhi Salaam in the Arabic language. So the Quran exists only in the Arabic language. Translations of the Quran are not of the Quran. Translations, the Quran is the word of Allah. The translations are the work of human beings. The word of Allah has no discrepancy, no inconsistency. But the work of human beings have mistakes in them. We can look at one mistake. For example, we have a very well-known translation of the Quran in English, into English by Abdullah Yusuf Ali. In Surah 21, Ayah number 87, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَذَنُّونَ إِذْ ذَهَبَ مُغَادِبًا فَظَنَّ أَنْ لَنْ نَقْدِرَ عَلَيْهِ فَنَادَى فِي الظُّلُمَاتِ أَنْ لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا أَنْتَ سُبْحَانَكَ إِنِّي كُنْتُ مِنَ الظَّالِمِينَ Yusuf Ali says, and remember Dhunun, that is the Prophet Yunus alayhi salam, when he departed in wrath, in anger, right? And then comes this very strange translation of Abdullah Yusuf Ali. He imagined, that is, Yunus alayhi salam imagined that we had no power over him. We, Allah, had no power over him. How is it conceivable that any prophet of Allah could ever imagine that Allah did not have power over him? Right? So this is a major mistake in translation. So it is, this is not the word of Allah. This is the mistake of Abdullah Yusuf Ali. And of course it goes on, but he cried through the depths of darkness, La ilaha illa anta subhanaka inni kuntu min al-zalimeen. Now, what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, that when he went, departed in anger, he thought that we will not restrict his sustenance. Lan, uh, you know, an lan naqdira alayhi. That is the correct meaning, not what Abdullah Yusuf Ali says. So we need to understand that the Quran is not what is there in other languages. What is there in other languages 
are translations of the Quran, works of human beings that can have mistakes in them, that can have misguidance and discrepancies in them as well. There is a deviant sect called the Qadianis who follow Mirza Ghulam Ahmad, right? And they have a translation and commentary of the Quran. And we can look at the deviance that they have in the translation. In Surah Al Jumu'ah, Surah number um, 62, if we look at the translation that they have given there for ayah number three, right? Surah Al Jumu'ah, right? Ayah number two says the translation is, He, that is Allah, it is who was raised among the unlettered, a messenger from among themselves who recites unto them his ayat, his signs, and purifies them and teaches them the book of wisdom, though before that they were in manifest error. And then they come to see in the next ayah. Right? So perhaps if we can see it on the screen, what they have said. Right? This is the Qadiani translation from Rabwa, which is, was the capital of there. Right? Um, if We'll get that slide up in a little while. So, they say, the ayah is, وَآخَرِينَ مِنْهُمْ لَمَّا يَلْحَقُوا بِهِمْ وَهُوَ الْعَزِيزُ الْحَكِيمُ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, and to confer these benefits on others of them who have not yet joined them. But this is what this deviant sect says in the translation of this ayah. And he will raise him, raise the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, among others of them who have not yet joined them. He is the mighty and the wise. And in the commentary, the last part, sentence in the commentary is, thus the Quran and the Hadith both agree that the present verse refers to the second advent of the Holy Prophet وسلم, in the person of the promised Messiah. This verse refers to the second advent of the Holy Prophet وسلم, in the person of the promised Messiah. So this is the deviancy that they uh, put in their translations and in their commentaries. So the Quran is the word of Allah revealed to the Prophet وسلم, through Jibreel salam in the Arabic language. Right? And we have seen that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has mentioned this 70 times, this name 70 times in the Quran itself. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions other names for his revelation. He calls it, you know, um, Al-Furqan in surah, surah number 25. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the first ayah, Tabaraka alladhi nazzala ala abdihi, nazzala al-Furqan ala abdihi لِيَكُونَ لِلْعَالَمِينَ نَذِيرًا He says, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, تَبَارَكَ الَّذِي نَزَّلَ الْفُرْقَانَ عَلَى نَزَّلَ الْفُرْقَانَ عَلَى أَبْدِهِ لِيَكُونَ لِلْعَالَمِينَ نَذِيرًا Blessed is he who set down the furqan, the criterion on his servant, his abd, so that he, the servant, may be a warner for all the worlds. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala names it as Al-Furqan. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also names it as Al-Dhikr, the message. In Surah Al-Hijr, Surah number 15, ayah number 9, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Inna nahnu nazzalna dhikr wa inna lahu lahafidhun. Verily we have sent down the message uh, verily, certainly we have sent down the message, the dhikr, and certainly, verily, we are the guardian thereof. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala names it as a dhikr Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also names it as al-kitab, the book, at the beginning of Surah Al-Baqarah, al flamim al la rayba fi. This book, there is no doubt in it. So Allah has named his revelation as al-kitab, the book. He has named it as a dhikr the message, he has named it as Al-Furqan, the criterion. And Imam Jalaluddin Suri in his um, Al-Itqan, Fi Ulum Al-Quran, has mentioned that there are 55 names of the Quran from the Quran. 
right? So the Quran, right? We need to understand um, that. Now, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uses this name. The beloved messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam also used this name. For example, in the hadith transmitted by Imam al-Bukhari, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is reported to have said, Khayrukum man ta'allama al-Qur'an wa allama. The best of you is the one who learns the Qur'an and teaches it. So the beloved messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam used the word Qur'an as the name. Or he says in a hadith transmitted by Imam al-Bukhari and Imam Muslim, الَّذِي يَقْرَأُ الْقُرْآنِ وَهُوَ مَاهِرٌ The one who recites the Qur'an and he is fluent in doing so. مَعَ السَّفَرَةِ الْكِرَامِ الْبَرَّةِ He will be the company of the noble and obedient and noble angels. مَنْ قَرَأَ الَّذِي يَقْرَأُ الْقُرْآنِ Using the name Qur'an. And the hadith goes on, right? Right? Uh, وَالَّذِي يَقْرَأُ الْقُرْآنِ And the one who recites the Qur'an وَهُوَ يَتَتَعْتَعُ فِيهِ وَهُوَ عَلَيْهِ شَاقِ And he, the one who recites the Qur'an haltingly, stammering and it is difficult in him he will have two rewards transmitted by Imam al-Bukhari and Imam Muslim So the beloved messenger وسلم, also used this name Al-Qur'an Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has used it the beloved messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam has used it. Now, the name Quran is derived from the verb qara'a, which means he read, right? Or he recited. And hence, Al-Quran means the reading, the recitation, right? We should know that. The reading, the recitation, right? So it has other names. We need to bear that in mind. So, the Quran is divided into part into surahs, uh, which we can translate as chapters, and every surah is divided into ayat, which has been translated as verses. Right now, surah, Su the word surah literally means a, a row or a fence, but as a term, it means the passage-wise division of the Quranic text. Right? Set apart from the preceding and the following text. The passage wise. So it is a chapter. So the Quran is divided into surahs, chapters, 114 in number. Right? And every surah is divided into ayat. Now, ayah is a sign, like the signs of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala call his ayat. So, ayah. Now, you know, people have some qualms and objections about using the word verse to translate ayah because they say the Quran is not poetry. Unfortunately, they never looked in the English dictionary to look as to see what is the meaning of verse. Yes, it refers to poetry, but this is the meaning of verse from the Cambridge Dictionary, one of the meanings. One of a series of short parts that the writing of a holy book is divided into. One of the short parts of the writing of uh, one of us, the series of short parts that the writing of a holy book is divided into. Nothing to do with poetry. Or in the Oxford Dictionary, right? It says each of the short, each of the short divisions of a chapter in the Bible. Right? Of course, they were referring to the Bible only. So the word verse is also used there. So we translate ayat as verse. And forget about people who don't know the meaning of the word verse properly. Yes, it refers to poetry and, and parts of poetry, etc. But it also refers to parts of a holy book. So ayah is translated as a verse. Ayah, the verses, surah, right, um, you know, is the chap translated as chapter. Now we have the surahs are of different lengths. The shortest surah in the Quran is Surah Al-Kawthar with only three ayat. And then we have the longest surah in the Quran, Surah Al-Baqarah, with 286 ayat, right? So Surah Al-Kawthar, three ayat, the shortest surah. Surah Al-Baqarah, the longest surah, 286 ayat, right? Now, the Quran has 114 surahs, and it has approximately 6,600 ayat 
in it, right? Ayat, an ayat are of varying lengths. The shortest ayah in the Quran has only one word. For example, Ar-Rahman, chapter 55, first ayah, the Rahman. Or in Surah Al-Rahman, in ayah number 64, we have the word Mudahamatan, one word, the ayah, right? Ayah number 64. So the shortest uh, 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 ayah is of one word in the glorious Quran, right? And the longest ayah in the Quran is Surah Al-Baqarah, ayah number 282. And, you know, in this ayah, we have, um, you know, more than, more than 125 words. So the shortest ayah, uh, I mean, the shortest ayah has one wor word. The longest ayah has more than 125 words. And the longest ayah of the Quran is Surah Al-Baqarah, ayah number 282, right? So we need to understand um, that, right? Now, um, the Quran is also divided into parts. Now, oh, first we need to understand this, that the, the surahs and the ayat uh, were the arrangement is be, was done by the beloved messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam based on what was revealed to him so the arrangement of the surahs is part of the revelation the arrangement of the ayat the verses is also part of the revelation this was not done by anybody else that the companions arranged the surahs that this is the first surah this is the second and this is the third or in a surah, the companions arrange the ayat. Or they said, well, the companions decide, Lord Allah, that this ayah should go in this surah and that ayah should go in the other surah. No. It was the beloved messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, based on wahi, that he informed the companions where this ayah has to go, in which surah, before which ayah, or after which ayah, etc. So the arrangement is from the beloved messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And now, who named the surahs? The, we have a lot of people saying different things about who named the surahs, right? Imam Jalaluddin Suyuti, he states in his itqan, the names of the surahs have been firmly fixed have been firmly fixed in the ahadith and the athar. And were it not for fear of being too wordy, I, that is Jalaluddin Shuti, I would clarify the details of this for you here. So the names of the surahs are from Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, right? It is not that companions named the surahs or others named the surahs. And in, we have a number of hadith in which the beloved messenger وسلم, referred to surahs, different surahs by their names. So the names are from the beloved messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Right. Now, there is a division of the Quran into 30 parts and each part is called a juz. Right? A juz. Now this division was not done by Rasulullah or the companions. It was done subsequently. But since that time, there is a consensus of Muslims, of the Ummah, on this division of the Quran in 30 parts. So we don't have that in some countries they accept a division in 30 parts and other countries they don't accept it in 30 parts. So they, they have the Quran without any parts, separate parts. Right? So each part is called a Jews. Right? And in Urdu, they call it, you know, um, ajza or as well. It's called, um, in Urdu, it is called para, right? So we have, um, you know, 30 Jews in the glorious Quran. Now, this information, if we look at copies of the Quran, we will see this information. Now, the copies of the Quran that are printed in Medina, for example, they divide each juz into two 
Hizb. Each juz is divided into two hizb, right? And the information is contained in at the top of the page. On the right hand side, as you can see there, it says Al Hizbul Awalu, the first hizb. And on the left hand side of the page, and this is about every page in the Quran, whether it is an even number page or an odd numbered page, the right side at the top. It has the, the number of the Jews, and the left side, it has the name of the surah, Surah Al Baqarah. Right? And each hizb is divided into four quarters, and these quarters are called Rub'ul Hizb, quarter of the hizb, and then Nisful Hizb, half of the hizb, and then Thalathatu Arba'il Hizb, three quarters of the hizb. Right? So we have quarter of hizb, half of hizb, and three quarters of hizb, and then we have the next hizb, right? So each juz is divided into two hizb. So al juzul awwal, the first juz, you know, we have al hizb number one and al hizb number two. And each hizb is divided into four quarters, right? So we have rubu al hizb number one, nisful al hizb number one, Salathat wa arba al hizb number two number one and then at the end then we will have al hizb number two and this is mentioned at you know the side of the page pages right now in those copies printed in India and Pakistan each uh, uh, juz each juz is divided into four quarters. Those printed in Medina, each Jews is divided into two hizb, and each hizb is divided into four quarters. The copies printed in Pakistan and India, right, and in a number of other countries, each Jews is divided into four quarters. So we have Roba quarter, Nisf half, and it is supposed to be Salasa to Arba, but they just have Salasa, salasa three, in the bar, and then, you know, it continues. So, these copies that are printed in India and Pakistan, at the top of the page, on the right-hand side, they have the name of the Jews. They use the, na the first words in the Jews as the name. For example, Jews number one, they use Alif La Mim, because that is the, at the beginning. Jews number two, they use Sayakul. And the first line in the Jews is in bold. If if you look at, at that there. So at the top, we have the name of the Jews and the number of the Jews. Those copies printed in Manina, they just have the number of the Jews. And on the left-hand side, we have the name of the surah, but we also have the number of the surah. So we'll have Al-Baqarah 2, which is 2, which is surah number 2. Right? So right-hand side, the name of the Jews and the number of the Jews. Left-hand side at the top, the name of the surah and the number of the surah. And in the margins, we have, you know, rub, oh, and nisf, and salatha, and are uh, there. Quarter and a half, and it's supposed to be three quarters, but they just put three, and, you know, this. And now, every surah in those copies of the Quran that are printed in India and Pakistan and a number of other countries, each surah is divided into sections. And each section is called a ruku'a. A ruku'a, the same word that we use when we, for ruku' when we are performing salah. So a section. And at the end of the ruku', there's an ayn, the letter ayn. And the letter ayn is sometimes written over the sign for the end of the ayah as well as in the, mar in the side margin. A letter ayn. So when you see ayn, you know this is the end of a ruku'. The copies that are printed in Medina do not divide the surahs into sections. It just divides the Jews into two hizb and each hizb into quarters, right? So we have ayn at the end of the ruku. But this ayn has three numbers on it, if you can notice any ayn. It has a number at the top of the ayn, a number in the middle of the ayn, and a number below the ayn. The number at the top of the ayn indicates 
which ruku this is in this current surah, right? And then the number in the middle of the ayin indicates how many ayat this ruku has, right? And the number at the bottom of, or below the ayin indicates which ruku this is in this juz. So in this case that we are seeing there, we have at the top number 21. So it means this is the 21st ruku of this surah. In the middle, we have the number nine. It means this ruku has nine ayat. And at the bottom, it has five. It means that in this Jews, because this surah began previously, in the pre previous Jews, in this Jews, this is ruku number five. So it is ruku number 21 of the surah, from the very beginning of the surah, but only ruku number five of this surah in this Jews. Right, so these are numbers that give us information and we need to bear that in mind. Right? Okay. Now, um, right. So we need to understand that. Right? So again, the Quran, 114 surahs, each surah divided into ayat, the, short, the smallest number of ayat in a, in a, 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 a smallest number of words in an ayah is one word ar-Rahman or mudhammatan right or we can say wal asr well wal asr people can say maybe it's two words wa and al asr but ar-Rahman one word mudhammatan one word right and the shortest surah has only three ayat surah al-Kawthar the longest ayah right, has more than 125 words in it. It is ayah number 282 of Suratul Baqarah. Right? So we need to understand um, that. Right? And the information that we can get from the copies of the Quran from the top of the page and also on the side margin, right? Now, again, we need to bear in mind the arrangement of the ayat in, his, in every surah was done by the beloved messenger, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, based on revelation from Jibreel, Alayhi Salam. When Jibreel, Alayhi Salam, brought a revelation, he would inform the beloved messenger, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, where this revelation has to go. That is, in which surah, or before which ayat, or we, after which ayat, and, and so on, right? And the arrangement of the surah is also based on revelation to the beloved messenger, sallallahu alaihi wasallam, from Jibreel, alayhi salam, right? Okay. Um, now, the Quran, the, the surahs of the Quran are divided into two categories those that were revealed before the Hijrah and those that were revealed after the Hijrah. Those that were revealed before the Hijrah are called Makki. Literally, it means Makkan. It doesn't mean revealed in Makkah itself, but it means revealed before the Hijrah of the beloved messenger, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And those that were revealed after the Hijrah are known as Madani. Madani means Madinan. But it, again, it doesn't mean revealed in Medina. It means revealed after the Hijrah, right? So when the beloved messenger, Sallallahu came for the farewell Hajj, and the ayah was revealed to him, al yawma akmaltu lakum dinakum. This day I have perfected for you your deed. This was revealed in Arafat, and Arafat is not far away from Makkah, but it is Madinan, it is Madani, because it is revealed after the Hijrah. So we need to understand that. Now, the surahs, many of them have ayat that, that are makki and ayat that are madani, right? It is not that every surah is such that it is only makki or only madani, right? And according to a number of the scholars, the number of surahs that are makki in the Quran, are 80, the number is 85, and the number madani, 29. So 85 and 29. But the ayat, the Makki ayat, are short, 
ayat generally and the Madani ayat are long ayat. So the, the 1885 surahs that are Makki, they only take up about 11 Jews out of the 30 Jews in the Quran. And the 29 surahs that are Madani, they, uh, they, they take up 19 Jews. 19 Jews with Madani surahs, 11 Jews with Makki surahs, but 85 surahs that are Makki and 29 that are Madani. So this is one division of, of the Quran into Makki and Madani. Right? Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us, of another division of the glorious Quran. In Surah Alu Imran, Surah number three, at the beginning, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, right, this is ayah number, um, right, right, right. Um, Right, ayah number seven. Huwa alladhi anzala alayka al-kitab. He it is who has sent down on you, O Prophet, the book. Minhu ayatu muhkamat hunna ummul kitab. From this book, there are ayat that are muhkamat. Clear, established, fundamental um, verses. Hunna ummul kitab. Allah says they are the mother of the book. They are the foundation of the book. So, muhkamat. And Allah says, وَأُخَّرُوا mutashabihat, And other ayat are mutashabihat. So, the Quran, the ayat of the Quran are divided into two categories. The muhkamat, clear established verses, and the mutashabihat, the verses that are allegorical, that require uh, interpretation, etc. Now, all those ayat in the Quran that contain uh, legislation, legislation for fasting, legislation for um, you know uh, anything else, are muhkamat. And the ayat that deals with Jannah and Jahannam and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala establishing himself on the arsh and so on and so forth, these are mutashabihat. But then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala goes on in this ayah, ayah number seven, of Surah Al Amran, Allah says, فَأَمَّا الَّذِينَ فِي قُلُوبِهِمْ زَيْغَ But as for those in whose hearts there is diverse uh, perversity, فَيَتَّبِعُونَ مَا تَشَابَهَ مِنْهُ They follow the ayat that are mutashabihat. Why? اِبْتِغَاءَ الْفِتْنَةِ وَابْتِغَاءَ التَّعْوِيلِ Seeking discord and confusion by seeking the interpretation of the mustashabihat. But then Allah says, وَمَا يَعْلَمُ تَعْوِيلَهُ إِلَّا اللَّهُ وَالرَّاسِخُونَ فِي الْعِلْمِ No one knows the interpretation of the mutashabihat except Allah and those who are firmly grounded in knowledge. Now in some copies of the Quran, they put a compulsory stop after Allah. So they say, the ayah says, no one knows that interpretation of the these verses the mutasha except Allah and then they say and the mutasha and the, those who are firmly grounded in knowledge they say we believe in it everything is all is from Allah but the others who hold that that stop is a mistake if we say only Allah knows the interpretation of the mutasha bihat what we are also saying is that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to whom the Quran was revealed did not know the interpretation of the mutashabiyat which of course is not correct. So no one knows the interpretation of the mutashabiyat except Allah and those firmly grounded in knowledge. They say we believe in it all is from Allah. Right? And Allah says وَمَا يَذَّكَّرُوا إِلَّا أُولُوا الْأَلْبَابِ and none will grasp the message except men of understanding. So this is another division of the ayat. Allah says, muhkamat and mutashabihat. So we need to understand muhkamat and mutashabihat that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has mentioned here in um, the Quran itself, right? Muhkamat and mutashabihat, right? And, you know, 
if we can look at, you know, we have this book, the Ulumul Quran by Ahmad von Denfer. It is a very good introduction to the sciences of the Quran. And it has, you know, sections dealing, so the sections dealing with muhkamat and mutashabihat, right? And at the end of, of um, you know, the, he, he gives, you know, there, right? Now, we have one category of mutashabihat, which are called the huruf al muqatta'at, the, the letters, the similar letters like alif la mim, or ha mim, or ain sin qaf, or kaf ha ya ain sod, or noon. You know, these are letters that occur at the beginning of some surahs. 29 surahs have these letters uh, at their beginnings. And, you know, the number of letters that are used um, there, right, in various combinations that are there. Fourteen letters. Fourteen letters in these 29 surahs in different combinations. Alif Lam Ra, Alif Lam Mim, Ha Mim, you know, Alif Lam Mim Sod, you know, Sod, Ta Sin, Ta Sim Mim, Ta Ha, Qaf, Kaf Ha Ya Ain Sod, Noon, Yasin, right? Okay. Now, the beloved Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam did not tell us what these ayat mean. We have no information from the beloved Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam about the meaning of these ayat. Different Mufassirin have given what they think may be the meaning of these ayat, right? But in the final analysis, we have not been informed by the beloved messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam what the meanings are. But there are those among the scholars who hold that the beloved messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam certainly did know what the meanings were. And there are some who hold that this was a revelation that was meant only for Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, alif lam mim and ha mim and, and, and so on. And he understood what it means. But this was not meant to be transmitted. This is just a view. This was not expressed by the beloved messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa This is an, uh, an opinion, we may say, of some. But this is one category of mutashabihat, right? The huruf al muqatta'at at the beginning of 29 surahs. There is a combination of 14 letters of the glorious Quran. And when, we recite, when we recite the Quran, we have to recite them. We can't recite Surah Al-Baqarah and begin Dhalik Al-Kitab al fi We have to say Alif La Meeb Dhalik Al-Kitab al fi If Otherwise, we are not reciting the whole of the Surah. Right? So we have the Huruful Muqatta'at. Right? Okay. Now, we need to understand that there is a science in Ulum al-Qur'an called Asbabu Nuzul, the reasons, the, uh, literally the reasons for the revelation, but actually meaning the circumstances surrounding the revelation or, or the sending down of that revelation. And the scholars have, when they take the Asbabu Nuzul, these circumstances, they are able to understand verses better, they can see the immediate application. Let us take two cases of asbabu nuzul. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says lillahi al-mashriku wal-maghrib. Right? To Allah belong the east and the west. فَأَيْنَ مَا تُوَلُّوا فَثَمَّ وَجْهُ اللَّهِ So whichever direction you turn to, the face of Allah is there. Right? Ayah number 115 of Surah Al-Baqarah. وَلِلَّهِ الْمَشْرِكُ وَالْمَغْرِبِ فَأَيْنَمَا تُوَلُّوا فَثَمَّ وَجْهُ اللَّهِ To Allah belong the east and the west, which, so whichever direction you turn to, the face of Allah is there. Now, mistakenly, somebody might come to the conclusion that it doesn't matter which direction we turn to when we are performing salat, because فَأَيْنَمَا تُوَلُّوا فَثَمَّ وَجْهُ اللَّهِ Right? the face of Allah is there. But when we look at the circumstances surrounding this revelation, we see 
that the companions were traveling, some of the companions were traveling, and one night they did not know the direction of the Qibla. So they performed Salat, but then next day it became clear to them that they prayed in the wrong direction. Then they consulted the beloved messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and the beloved messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam waited until Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed this ayah. So it indicates that if people do not know the direction, this is the application of the qibla. They will try their level, they, could, they cannot find out they will try their level best to determine and they will pray in that direction. If subsequently they come to know that it is the wrong direction, their salat is still valid based on this. But it is not that we have the license to pray in whatsoever direction we wish to pray in. Right? So, asbabu nuzul, the circumstances surrounding a revelation. Right? Then we have the case. Right? That the companions, Rasulullah and the companions were on an expedition. And they had camped, they had stayed in a certain spot where there was no water, but they were staying there. And the plan was that they would then go on to camp at a further place where there was water. So many of the companions, knowing that they are going to camp in a place which had water, they had used up their water. But when they were about to leave, Sayyidatuna Aisha radiallahu ta'ala and her Ummul Mu'mineen realized that her necklace was missing. And that necklace was very dear to her because it was given to her as a gift on the day that she got married to the beloved messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So it was missing. So Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam asked the companions to look for her necklace. And they searched and searched and searched and searched and did not find the necklace. But then it became, became too late to move on to the other spot to camp, so they had to camp in that same place where there was no water. And now the companions were, many of them were very, were saddened by the fact that they will not be able to perform Salatul Fajr because they have no water to perform wudu. And during the night, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed this ayah, ayah number 43 of Surah An-Nisa. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, you know, uh, in this ayah here, right? Ya ayu alladhina amanu, la taqrabu salata wa antum sukara, hatta ta'lamu ma taqulun. O oh, you who have attained to faith, do not approach Salat when you are intoxicated until you come to know what you are saying. And then the ayah goes on. Right? Wala junuban illa abiri sabilin hatta taqtasilu. And not in a state, do not approach Salat in a state of janaba, major impurity, until you perform the ghusl. Right? Except if you are traveling. And then comes. وَإِن كُنْتُمْ مَرْضَىٰ أَوْ عَلَىٰ سَفَرٍ أَوْ جَاءَ أَحَدٌ مِّنْكُمْ مِّنَ الْغَائِتِ أَوْ لَا مَسْتُمُ النِّسَاءِ فَلَمْ تَجِدُ مَا But if you are sick or on a journey or one of you has come from answering a call of nature or you have been in contact with females and you do not find water فَتَيَمَّمُوا سَعِيدًا طَيِّبًا Then perform tayammum with clean earth or sand فَمْسَحُوا بِوُجُوهِكُمْ وَأَيْدِيكُمْ And Wipe therewith your faces and your hands with this clean dust or clean dirt. In Allah kana afu wan ghafura. Certainly Allah is afu, right? Uh, the all forgiving, all merciful, um, uh, ever forgiving, right? So, in the circumstances, there was no water, and they were in in the desert, no water. Allah Subhanahu wa Taala revealed the guidance for tayammum. So this is, you know, the uh, asbab or the circum these are the circumstances surrounding that revelation. 
So when we come to know the Asbabu Nuzul, we are able to see the application of the revelation. In some cases, right away. Or we are able to see, you know, the legislation that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given. Or we are able to understand what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, like, you know, whichever direction you turn to, you know, um, the, the face of Allah is, is there. Now, we have ayat that were in response to questions. People asked the beloved messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa questions. And uh, some of these Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions that questions were asked. Like, for example, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, yasalunaka. They ask you, O Prophet, right? Uh, for example, ayah number uh, 219 of Surah Al-Baqarah. Yes, alunaka anil khamri wal maisir. They ask you, O Prophet, about intoxicants and about gambling. Right? They ask you. So this is the question. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reveals the answer here. And the asbab, the, the circumstances surrounding the revelation is the question that was asked to the beloved messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Allah says, Kul ithmun wa In these two things, in intoxicants and in gambling, there is a great sin and there are benefits for mankind. Wa ithmuhuma akbaru min naf'ihima. And their sin is greater than their benefit. Right? So this was there. And then the ayah goes on. Wa yas'alunaka maadha yunfiquna qulil af. They ask you, O Prophet, what they should spend. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala responds, they should spend whatever is beyond their needs. Right? So, yes, alunaka. Right? And then the next ayah, Allah says, yes, alunaka anil yatama. They ask you about the orphans. Right? So Allah says, kul islahu lahum khair. That you know, the best thing to do is to, uh, what is for their good. Right? And, and so on. Right? And, you know, um, uh, ayah number 222 Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says you know yes'alunaka anil mahid they ask you O Prophet about the menstrual periods qul huwa adha and Yusuf Ali's translation is, is, is uh, you know is, is uh, not a good translation not a right translation he has translated it as they are a hurt and a pollution but that is not the correct translation. Um, uh, people like, for example, Muhammad Assad, they have translated it. Uh, say, O Prophet, say, it is a vulnerable condition. The period, the menstrual period, is a vulnerable condition. This is what Muhammad Assad said, and this is more in keeping with what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, not that it is a pollution and a hurt, right? Um, so, the answer, is the, the asbabu nuzul that we get the question, right? Or before that in ayah number 17, 217, sorry, yas'alunaka ani shahri al-haram. They ask you, O Prophet, about the sacred month, kital in fee, fighting in the sacred month. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives, right? So we have questions that were asked to the beloved messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and he answered. So this is the asbabu nuzul. So, we, this is studied, you know, we have the case, Ummul Mu'mineen, Ummu Salama, asked the beloved messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, why is it that only the rewards for males are mentioned in the Quran? Now, you know that in Arabic, as well as in other, many other languages, when you use we, the masculine plural, sometimes it means only males, but if you have both males and females, we use the masculine plural. So when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ya you ladina amanu, O you who have attained to faith, although it is masculine plural, it doesn't mean O oh, oh, you males who have attained to faith. It means O oh, you males and females who have attained to faith. But she asked this question from the beloved messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed some ayat. Among them is ayah number 35 of Surah Al-Ahzab, Surah number 33, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, إِنَّ الْمُسْلِمِينَ وَالْمُسْلِمَاتِ وَالْمُؤْمِنِينَ وَالْمُؤْمِنَاتِ وَالْقَانِتِينَ وَالْقَانِتَاتِ وَالصَّادِقِينَ وَالصَّادِقَاتِ وَالصَّابِرِينَ وَالصَّابِرَاتِ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions 10 categories of persons, and in each one of them, Allah 
explicitly says the males who belong to this category and the females who belong to this category, right? And the last category, number 10, is zakirin Allah, kathina wa zakirat. The males who engage in the abundant remembrance of Allah and the females who engage in the abundant remembrance of Allah. A'adda Allahu lahum maghfiratan wa ajran azima. Allah has prepared for them forgiveness and a magnificent reward. So explicitly mentioned rewards for males as well as females, right? So, asbabu nuzul. So in this science, we study the circumstances surrounding different revelations that were sent to the beloved messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Some of them, as I said, in response to questions. Some of them in response to general situations, right? Um, when the Muslims made the hijra to Medina, there was a community of Jews living in Medina, right? And the people saw how they treated females who were in their periods. They cut relations off from them. The Jewish law is that a female in her period, right, is impure. And everything she touches becomes impure. If she touches a, a, ut a utensil, the utensil is impure, impure, and so on. So they had to separate themselves from females in their period, right? So that is the ayah where Rasulullah Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions, you know, um, they ask you about the period. And Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, you know, um, everything is permissible in the period of a female except sexual relations, right? So it is not that you have to cut yourself, cut them off from yourself and they can't touch anything and, and, and so on and so forth, right? And, you know, if they touch a utensil, then they have to go and clean that utensil. This was the Jewish. This is the Jewish law, um, in, a, in a number of ways before they can use that utensil again, and, and so on. Right. So, asbabu nuzul, the circumstances surrounding a revelation. Right. So we need, um, you know, mostly we the, the, the scholars then they tell us, they inform us of the circumstances, and then they give us commentaries of the ayat, taking the asbabu nuzul, the circumstances surrounding the revelations into um, consideration, right? Then, we have what is called abrogation, naskh, right? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Surah Al-Baqarah says, right, ayah number 206, Surah Al-Baqarah, ayah number 206, Ma nansakh min ayatin aw nunsiha. No ayah do we abrogate or cause to be forgotten. Right? Ma nansakh min ayatin aw nunsiha. Right? Um, uh, surah, sorry. Uh, surah, uh, ayah number 106, not 206. Surah to Baqarah, surah number 2, ayah number 106. Man nansakh min ayatin aw nunsiha na'ti bi khayrin minha aw mithliha. No ayah do we abrogate or cause to be forgotten except that we replace it with that which is better than it or with the like of it. Alam ta'alam anna Allah ala kulli shayin qadir. Do you not uh, know that Allah has power over all things? Right? Now based on this ayah, we have the uh, principle of abrogation. And we have some differences of view on the question of abrogation. And those who hold that abrogation, you know, abrogate means to cancel or repeal. That there's abrogation in the Quran. That there were some verses that used to be part of the Quran, that used to be recited first, and then they were abrogated, and so they were removed from the Quran. Right? And the general position is that there is no such verse that used to be part of the Quran and was taken out and was not subsequently not recited. Even though there may be a, a, a report here or a report there that is indicating that, right? But the overwhelming view is there is no such ayah. Then there is the view that there, there, is a, there are ayat in the Quran, the ruling of which has been abrogated. But the ayah is still there, right? Okay. Now, Imam Jalaluddin Suyuti, rahmatullahi ta'ala alayhi, who is perhaps, you know, his work on ulumul Qur'an, al-itqan fi ulumul Qur'an is perhaps 
the major work in Ulum al Quran, and subsequent to him, I mean, for, uh, following him, every work on Ulum al Quran had to take the work Al Itqan into consideration. You know, he has gathered all the ayat that people have said are abrogated, and he discussed all of them. And he came to the conclusion that only 21 ayat are abrogated, are mansukh. Mansukh means abrogated. Nasikh means that which abrogates, and mansukh means abrogated, that which is abrogated. And subsequent to him, we have Imam Shah Waliullah in Delhi, who died about 350 years ago. Um, uh, 360 years ago. He took the 21 verses that Imam Jalaluddin Suyuti said are abrogated. And he discussed them. And he showed out of these 21 verses, 16 of them are still applicable in some way or the other. And he said only five are abrogated. Now, let us look at one of them which the whole is abrogated. In Surah Al-Ahzab, Surah number 33, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave the beloved messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam permission to marry more than four wives. This is ayah number 50. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this ayah says, you know, that this is, uh, you know, um, only for you and not for the believers, right? Um, you know, uh, you know, here, khalisatan laka min dunil mu'mineen. This permission to marry more than four is only for you and not for the believers. But then subsequently, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in ayah number 52 says, right? La yahillu laka nisa'u min ba'd. It is not permissible for you to marry any women after this. So they, what they have said, that this abrogates the first. Well, in a sense it does. Rasulullah was given the permission and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then ended that permission. So they're saying, you know, and this is what one of the five that, that, um, Imam Shah Walila says abrogated. He had permission and then he no longer has that permission. Or Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, you know, um, that the believers, when the believers, um, you know, um, you know, they are able, you know, believers can, they can, um, you know, in, in, in Surah Al-Anfal, Allah subhanahu Surah number 8, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, right, there, um, right, um, that if there are um, 10 believers, they will be sufficient for, uh, they will take care of, you know, 200 um, you know, uh, sorry, uh, if they are 20, they will be able to uh, withstand 10 times as many. So then the companions um, started feeling that this may be a little bit too hard on them, that they will be, you know. So, ayah number 65, right? Allah says, Ya ayyuhan nabi, haridil mu'minina ala al-qital. O you, O Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Arouse the, browse the believers to fight. And then Allah says, right, in yakum minkum ishuruna sabirun, if there are from among you 20 who are patient and persevering, yaglibu miyatain, they will be able to defeat 200. And if 100, they will vanquish 1,000 of the unbelievers. Right? And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then says, reveal subsequently the ayah, now Allah has lightened the task for you. And Allah knows that there is weakness among you. So if there are 100 from among you who are patient and persevering, they will be able to defeat 200. 
So first Allah says, if there are 20, you will be able to defeat 200. But now Allah says, like, so they said, well, this abrogated, abrogated the early position. Now, there is no legislation here, but this is what they're saying. So we have ayat like that, that are considered to be, uh, you know, superseded by subsequent revelations. And it comes under the category of uh, naskh, abrogation. Now, there are some ayat that people say are abrogated that are not abrogated. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in that ayah we looked at ask you about uh, uh, intoxicants and gambling. Say in it is a great sin and some benefit and a sin is greater than the benefit. Then Allah said do not approach salat when you are intoxicated until you come to know what you are saying. So there are those who say this ayah is, is abrogated now. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah uh, Ma'idah Surah number 5 uh, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made, it says that this is an abomination of the handiwork of the devil, right? So they say that this abrogates the, the, what Allah says, you know, do not approach salat when you are intoxicated, right? Ya yuladina amanu innam al khamru wal maysiru wa nansawu wal azlam rijisum min amali shaitan O you who have attained to faith, certainly intoxicants and gambling and divination of arrows and um, and dedication of stone and divination are an abomination of the handiwork of the devil. Then Allah says, Fajtanibu. So shun that abomination in order that you may be successful. And shaitan's plan is only to use intoxicants and gambling to create, um, uh, you know, enmity and hatred among you and to hinder you from the remembrance of Allah and from Salat. Will you not then desist? So they say this ayat abrogates that, but it doesn't abrogate. The ayah is still applicable, right? The scholars do not count that as abrogated, but people say abrogated. No, it is not abrogated. It is still applicable. If you have a Muslim who thinks intoxicants, the ruling is still there on him. Do not approach salat when you are intoxicated. You are committing a grave sin, but you cannot perform salat when you are intoxicated, right? So it is still applicable. And there are those who hold that the ayah dealing with fasting, right? Um, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has, uh, you know, abrogated it, right? And we have Abdullah ibn Abbas radiallahu ta'ala himself saying it is not abrogated. You know, in, in Surah, Surah Al-Baqarah, the ayat that deal with fasting, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, you know, وَعَلَى الَّذِينَ يُتِيقُونَهُ فِدْيَةٌ تُعَامُوا مِسْقِينَ And for those who are able, the feeding of one person. So instead of fasting, you could feed. And they said, subsequently, this was abrogated and you have to fast. You can't do that. But Abdullah ibn Abbas radiallahu ta'ala says that this ayah is not abrogated. This is from Abdullah ibn Abbas himself. Although there are people who are saying that the ayah is abrogated. Right? So... Ibn Abbas radiallahu ta'ala is reported of said, transmitted by Imam al-Bukhari. This verse is not abrogated. It is meant for old men and old women who have no strength to fast. That they should feed one poor person for each day of fasting. Right? So the ayah is still applicable. It is not abrogated. Although people say it is abrogated. Now what does that ayah mean? Right? مَا نَنْسَخْ مِنْ آيَةٍ أَوْ نُنْسِيهَا نَأْتِ بِخَيْرِ مِنْهَا أَوْ مِثْلِهَا no ayah do we abrogate or cause to be forgotten except that we replace it with that which is better or, si or something similar. Commentators state that in this ayah, the word ayah refers to ayah of previous revelations. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, no ayah do we abrogate of previous revelations except that we bring in its place that which is better or uh, the like of it. Now you know, we have the Ten Commandments for example, Ten Commandments. Many of us are not aware that nine of these Ten Commandments are still compulsory upon us. You know, thou shalt not steal, and thou shalt not kill, and thou shalt not commit adultery, and covet, and, 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 and so on and so forth, right? There is, but there is one commandment that has been abrogated, and that is observing the Sabbath. It was compulsory on the Bani Israel to observe the Sabbath which was the seventh day, which is actually Saturday, because the Christians subsequently changed it to Sunday. Sabbath. On the Sabbath, they could neither work nor play. They could only rest and worship. That's all. And 
Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala abrogated it. So, ma nansak min ayatin au nunsiha, no ayah do we abrogate or uh, cause to be forgotten except that we bring in its place that which is better or the like of it. So, abrogation did take place, but abrogation of previous, from previous revelations when the beloved messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam came. Now, there is abrogation in the sunnah. There is. And some of the ahadith are very explicit on this. The beloved messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, I prohibited you from visiting graves, but visit them now for the reminder of the hereafter. So he abrogated the prohibition and then gave permission, right? And he said so, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Or he said, I prohibited you from storing the meat of the sacrificial animal for more than three days. But that prohibition was because there was a famine in, uh, in Medina. And he wanted the meat to be spread as widely as possible. But now you may eat and store as you wish. So he abrogated the prohibition and gave permission. Right? And then some of the abrogations are not mentioned. right? But when the hadith are considered, then we realize abrogation. When khamar, when intoxicants were made prohibited, then the beloved messenger وسلم, gave an instruction that every utensil that was made that that was used to contain or manufacture intoxicants must be destroyed so they could not reuse any container any utensil that was used either to store or 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 manufacture intoxicants subsequently subsequently afterwards when you know this link between the people and wine was severed you know because you know Wine drinking was very widespread. We have a number of companions who used to drink wine before it was prohibited. Subsequently, some persons accepted Islam and they used to drink, of course, intoxicants. They requested the beloved messenger, or they asked the beloved messenger, if they could reuse the utensils that were used for manufacturing or storing intoxicants after washing them. And the beloved messenger, Sallallahu told them yes. So he abrogated the earlier, prohibi the earlier instruction to destroy all the utensils, and he gave permission. So abrogation is there in the sunnah, yes. Things, rulings were given which were abrogated. But there's no such abrogation in the Quran. We need to understand that. And yes, there is superseding, as we have seen. Rasulullah was given permission to marry more than four, and then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, no, do not marry anymore after this. Right. Or Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, you know, um, if you have 20 persons who are firm and, and, and persevering and steadfast, they will be able to vanquish 200. But then Allah says, now, you know, he knows there's weakness in you. So if there's, uh, you know, 100, you will be able to overcome 200. Right. So we have superseding like these. And, you know, just bear in mind that Imam Shah Waliullah took, his, well, Imam um, uh, you know, Suyuti, right? Imam Jalaluddin Suyuti, he discussed, took all the ayat that different people say were abrogated, and he con discussed all of them. And he said 21. He, there were 21 that he could not find any way that they were not, and he said they were abrogated. Then Imam Shawaliya took those 21, and he said, you know, out of these 21, 16, he showed ways that 16 are still applicable. He said only five. And in these five, you know, we have some of these that are here. And from the time of Imam Shah Walila, I think he died around the year 1759. Um, there have been others who have been then taking up his five and looking at see how they can be applied as well. So this is Nasq abrogation, right? So this is the revelation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to the beloved messenger. The word of Allah revealed to the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, through the agency of Jibreel وسلم, in the Arabic language, Al-Quran. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we have seen, uses this name se this in the Quran. 70 times this name is mentioned in the Quran. We need to understand um, that, you know. And, um, you know, the Quran, there are those who have counted the number of ayat in the Quran, right? They have come with a certain number of ayat in the Quran, and they have counted, they are those who have counted the number of letters in the Quran, you know. And 
you know, we have um, there, you know, um, and the word that is most mentioned most frequently in the Quran is the name of Allah. Allah, right? About 2,700 times. The Quran has about 77,000 words, right? And 2,000, about 2,700 times the name of Allah is mentioned, right? And Rabb is mentioned, they have been counted them 969 times, Rabb, right? So these are the two most frequently mentioned words. And then we have, you know, the word for belief, the roots and deriv derivatives of amana, ay, alif, you know, mim, noon, amana, 811 times. And the word for speaking, kala and kul and so on, saying, you know, 1721. And the word to be, kana and yakunu and so on, yeah, right? that root, 1388. But one of the most frequently mentioned words in the Quran are the word is the root dealing with knowledge, ilm, and its derivatives, 779 times. So out of 77,000 words in the Quran, 779 times the word dealing with knowledge is mentioned. So about 1% of the words of the Quran dealing with that. So that is why people like Franz Rosenthal have said that, you know, that knowledge is, you know, that there is no civilization in which the knowledge was given that um, exalted position other than in Islam. Right. Anyhow, so this is the text of the glorious Quran and its divisions and certain aspects, certain sciences that we do. Now, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless us with that capability of truly striving, truly striving to recite his word as it ought to be recited and to study it as it ought to be studied and to follow it as it ought to be followed. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guide and bless us all and may he reward Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam on all we have as he Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam deserves to be rewarded. Allahumma salli wa sallim ala Sayyidina wa Mawlana Muhammadin fi kulli lamhati wa nafas adada ma wasiyahu ilmuk wa salamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.